Hello, welcome to the first of our blogs on the making of The Hobbit. It's amazing to be back here again. This is Bag End, exactly as it was in The Lord of the Rings. It's actually built in our B stage here in Wellington, and which is exactly the same stage as it was built 12 years ago. We've been shooting for a few days now, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a little look at the lead up to filming and some of the pre-production that led up to a, the first day of our shoot. And I look forward to keeping you up to date as we go through the next two or three years. See you soon. Oh, you're in 3D. Looking good. See ya. And this pulls beautifully. Uh, this yeah. looks great when it's drawn. Oh, so it actually works. And he can also go fighting with the remnants of sort of sort of hanging onto his body and, and be impaling people. <laughs> wanted to create a very non-human shape. We do need to do a little vlog. You might want to say hi to the fans of The Hobbit. Fans. Yeah. Shy artists. Oh dear, oh dear. So we're uh, going up to wardrobe and we're having a look at a couple of dwarf um, wardrobe and makeup fittings, which is always exciting. Not that we'll show you much in this particular blog, because we'll save that for the future, but at least you'll get to see a little bit of our wardrobe department. A lot of very busy people working and a lot of costumes. A lot of interesting textures and detail and leather and embossing, and it's all pretty cool up here. It's like a sort of a, a big uh, wizard's workshop. Hello. Hello. Oh my God, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. You no. can use them like a mace. Oh, yeah. So you can just absolutely. swing knocking and then cut the throat yeah. and whack it, whack it. Glenn was saying there's a nice so, you know, bit where you just go <laughs> and take right. out about 10 orcs. Right, with those, yeah. With those. yeah, 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 yeah. Now this is a familiar set, it's Elrond's Chambers and it's an exact copy of the one that we had in the Fellowship of the Ring. In fact just over here on the balcony is where the Council of Elrond took place. Where um, the Fellowship was formed and Frodo volunteered to take the Ring to Mordor. But also in The Hobbit there's going to be a lot of new bits of Rivendell that we haven't seen before. Some really cool bits of Rivendell actually that we will keep as a little surprise for the time being. Now there's an old friend upstairs, let's just have a quick look. Here we are, I'm sure you'll recognise the statue where Narsal, the broken sword, sits. And of course, in the time of the Hobbit, the sword is going to be here. And it is strange walking around here because you kind of, it was, you know, 10 or 11 years ago. And I'm used to looking at a set like this on film, you know, and now we're walking back into it again. It's almost like you've stepped inside a movie. It's a very weird experience. When we have a door blocked off, we should... This is where we're going to be shooting at the very beginning of our shoot. It's the goblin tunnels below the Misty Mountains. It's uh, a very iconic scene in The Hobbit where Bilbo has an encounter with, uh, well, you know who it's with, don't you, if you've read The Hobbit. No need to spoil it for anybody that hasn't. But uh, this is like a little network of caves. Look, there's a whole other little set of passageways down here. It's very um, claustrophobic. But one of the things we've done in order to be able to shoot the shots is to make sure that all the different walls of the cave can be removed so that our big bulky cameras can actually shoot the angles that we need. Oh my God, look at, look at this thing here. That looks like a foot or an arm. Oh, I don't know. That looks rather creepy, doesn't it? Ooh. Okay. Is this, uh, so how many chairs do we need? For instance, should we um, 
I reckon Bomber sits at the end. Of, and then, and then there's a slight grapple, and then when you, when you pop down, it's like, Wah! And then it's like, so it's a cue. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I know it's sort of safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is blocking. This is sort of not really rehearsing, but we're kind of getting the actors are walking through and we're sort of talking about what to do with the scene. And it's actually fun because it means when we come to shoot this, we've got a plan. It'd be good, it'd be good if you come forward and, and then you realise there's something on your, on your, on your foot and, you, and perhaps you, you, come, you try to get, get rid of it first, you know, and then you kind of... This will be fun. This will be more fun when everybody's in makeup and costumes and dying of the heat. Uh, sort of on the corner of the table, we've got Killy. Awesome. Next to Killy, Philly. And then uh, Dory. Dory and then Nori. Oh my god. Ori, Dory, Nori, Biffa, Bomba, Biffa, 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 Dory, Nori. This is a nightmare. We'll have Gandalf here in Florence. So I, th I thought it would be good to give you this whole doorway to play and be kind of. The fire will be blazing as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you ever being shamed? Oh, is it? Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, my prediction is it's all going to go incredibly well on the day. Don't, don't you agree? Um, the tricky thing is that uh, there are 13 dwarves in this set. <laughs> the good news is you're not in a fat suit. <laughs> no, no, no. I am in a nose and false eyebrows, a wig, a moustache and a beard. But you're right, no fat suit. You're way, no fat you're way ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're a winner. You're a winner every step of the way. Uh, no. And we can stick a fan up your robe just to <laughs> sort of give you a bit of air conditioning. Promises, promises. <laughs> well, that's going to work with a little bit of finessing. That's going to yeah. kind of work. Morning. 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 How are you? Morning. So I'm officially the first person in the makeup chair on the Hobbit. Officially. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so long for this day to begin this extraordinary journey filming The Hobbit. I would like to wish them good luck, good health and good harmony and Martin would like to say something. Thank you. My name is Martin Freeman. I'm in the cast as well. Uh, he stole everything I was about to say in Maui. <laughs> As Richard said, this has been a long time coming today. It's been even longer than we thought it was going to be. Um, so I hope at the end of this journey we are all as close with each other as at the moment we have the potential to be. So thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Andy Zirkis. I am standing up there just to say on behalf of the returning crew and cast who have come gathered here uh, to go on the journey and uh, and we, we're just very very grateful to your incredible hospitality uh, and to have the, the opportunity to share the passion for telling such an amazing amazing story in such an amazing country with such beautiful people thank you you know for a long time i thought that going back to the amazing experience of Lord of the Rings wouldn't be a, 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 good, a good idea. Um, but really, you know, now I've come completely around because films are stressful and they're hard to make, but ultimately what makes them fun is the people that you work with. And the fact that, you know, we're going to be working with a lot of the old gang, with a lot of friends, and obviously making some new friends is really the point of being here. 
So uh, I'm extremely thrilled. If somebody came up to me today and said that we could <coughs> carry on pre-production for another six weeks, I'd say no, no. Hell no, let's just start shooting. <laughs> In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Sky darkens and flames and cloud. That's great. Good. 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 That's Fabo. Febo, 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 thank you very, very much. Yay! That's the one. Hey, well, thank you very much, everybody, for a great first block. And um, have a great break. Everyone's having a break, and we will see you back here soon enough. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the second unit, that is a wrap on block one. So we're just going to get to one more pickup in Bag End. Uh, hello. Yep. Come on. Uh, oh, sorry. Hi, Pete. Hey, to, uh, Andy. Come on doing? in. Just wanted to do one more pickup in here. If that was all right. What's this? Oh, this is the video blog pickup. Yeah. That's, that's right. There, yeah, go. End of block one. But anyway, we've um, we just wanted to say hi to everybody because we haven't done one of these video blogs since the beginning of the shoot. God, it feels like a lifetime. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't. Because you, the first week of shooting. We did what Andy has got him. <laughs> you weren't a second unit director in those days. You, no, were, you were an actor. No, no, you were an old fashioned no, 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 no. artist. And now I've crossed over to the dark side. You've now gone to the dark side. I'm white. I'm absolutely, <laughs> absolutely white. It's all yours. Is it? Oh, okay. Just give us a good battle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Uh, you get tired. I always just tell people well, I get exhausted at the end of the first couple of days and stay exhausted <laughs> until it finishes. You know, we have 250 days of shooting on these two Hobbit movies, and I think it's a much better way to divide that up into three blocks and then have some time to edit what you've done, look at it, hand visual effects shots over to the CGI guys. You can really focus on the script revisions. It's just a, it's a much smarter way to mm. shoot these big films. Yeah, on something of this scale right. too. I mean, when we got the Given Art t-shirts, which said 54 days down, 200 to go, <laughs> I have to admit, I don't know how, how great it was. Uh, please wear these. It wasn't set exactly tomorrow. a morale lifting <laughs> moment, was it? <laughs> Everywhere you turn on, on the people's backs was 200 days to go. It's like, oh, God, I felt tired before lunch, you know. Good news is that it's over. First day back is Monday, the 5th of September. So thank you, guys. What are you guys off to during the break? Uh, my wife and I, my lovely wife, Aileen, we've got a holiday in the South Island of New Zealand planned. Two and my lovely, the my lovely, gorgeous wife, Nicole, and I are just going to work on the house. I'm leaving shortly after talking to you uh, for London, which is a long journey uh, by plane, and, and uh, once there I, I immediately go into production of a, of a play I'm going to do by Eduardo de Filippo. I'm uh, going to America, to Pebble Beach, in a week to play some golf. Work on my tan so that I can really freak the makeup people out when I come back. I'm having a break. <laughs> I'm having four weeks off. Bit of sleeping in. My favourite hobby. First, we're going to Australia to see our eldest daughter. I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to attempt to to sort of write and record a bit of a psychedelic sludge rock album. Hitting the fabric shops in central London. And I go home to Thailand tomorrow. To Barcelona to meet top two fans from Spain. Bali for 11 days. London and Paris to see friends. Manhattan Beach because it's the closest beach to the airport. I haven't been home for the last three years back in Belgium so my mum is cracking the whip. And then I'm going to Vegas and spend all my hard-earned cash. Do some more swimming and lots of golf. Probably get a, bit, a little bit drunk, a little bit on a holiday. Oh, I'm looking forward to going back with mates and getting on the drink where I'm not going to get a bad reputation because they already know what I'm like. And now I'm going back to Ireland to see my family and see some of my mates in Belfast for a, a quiet little weekend. I hope no one throws me for about three weeks at least. Hopefully come back totally refreshed and ready to rock in the next lot. What are you doing on break, Andy? Well, I'm going back home to uh, maybe have a little bit of time off 
had to go on all over the family, and then, and then really, before you know it, I'll be back. It's weird because you, you get to this point when you're at the end of a block of shooting and you, it sort of almost feels like you're going on vacation, but it's not because mm -hmm. I, on Monday morning I'm in the cutting room um, yeah. editing and I've got to have meetings with Alan and John and Dan about designing stuff for the second block and with Richard Taylor about all the things he has to build. So in some respects I, I'm back into pre-production again, but also I, I'm in post-production because I'm editing Plus we're in production because we're shooting these movies. So yeah. it's sort of like being in pre-production, production and post-production all at the same time. It kind of gets a bit, a bit screwy. But before I get to do any of that, I've got to jump on a plane tomorrow morning and go location scouting down the South Island. So we'll take some good pictures. Yeah, 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 I will. I will take some good pictures. Since we're going to be doing location shooting during our next block of shooting, it's really time to have to nail everything down. Well, on the recce, there'll be, uh, it's usually about 17 of us that go. We get around in five helicopters, usually. <laughs> it's quite a spectacle when we turn up. Peter, Caro, uh, Zane, Bridget, Andrew, Dan Henner, uh, Simon Bright, art director, Steve Ingram, John Howe, Ellen Lee, uh, Eric Sandin, we have Tony Kitty, The Grip, uh, Reg Garside, Gaffer, and myself, Location Scout, Dave Comer joins us, and Peter's assistant, Sebastian, the ever faithful Sebastian's there. Here on the mountains, I put my hand out and a cup of tea slides into it. That's what we like. There's even a Starbucks <laughs> up here in the Southern Alps. Slippery, hard to walk, and juggle a cup of tea at the same time on this sort of... I know, it's no mean feat. I never come prepared for these things. I always somehow imagine it's going to be dry and warm and nice. At least it's not raining. We'll be not just scouting, which is essentially searching for locations, we're now returning to the locations that we liked and we're going to start to talk about the logistics. The old thing, by the time you've helicoptered everybody in and then you've got to helicopter them out before nightfall, you're not actually here early morning or late afternoon. No, so right, it's yeah, all, during the middle it's of the all day, broad yeah. Well, yeah. Camp unless, unless you camp out here. Well, that just, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On set, we are allowing approximately half a rugby field for the essential equipment trucks and then our marquees, crew parking and also unit based parking which is where all our makeup and costume facilities are. If you make a path along the edge of the swamp in this In essence we need to create space for two rugby fields of equipment. It's weird on locations because you're standing in the middle of a mountain or, or, or a valley or some beautiful place and you're having to figure out, you know, where are we going to put the crew tents? Where are people going to get changed? Where are the portaloos going to go? Because all that stuff has to be where you're not going to want to point the camera. You can have Gandalf and the dwarves sort of running up over this brow here and scurrying, hiding down behind these rocks and just as they get there you crane up and there's one. The last thing you want to find out in six months' time is you're standing on this beautiful mountain and saying, wow, this is exactly the shot I want to do when you find you've got, you know, 20 portal lose right in front of the camera. That's not what you want to do. So you've got to figure all that stuff out. We've got to keep looking. It's mm -hmm. sort of it's sooner rather later, isn't it? Yeah. We'll be flying, I, I don't know, maybe 30 locations, no. locations probably. We're shooting locations around the Mackenzie country, around wilder landscapes below Mount Cook. And we will also be shooting around Dunedin Way, more beautiful stone, rock, you know, wild country, and that's quite exciting because it's an area of Middle Earth we haven't visited before. That big rock could be part of a house, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Where we're scouting presently for the ancient Mirkwood and the Anduin grasslands is south of Queenstown. That's pretty incredible. And shooting that. We're still searching and trying to work out how we're going to shoot Lonely Mountain, Misty Mountain Pass. Lonely Mountain should be by itself, but you can look over in that yeah. direction there. There's still a few rivers that we're scouting for. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're getting pretty close to photographing every decent river in New Zealand now. It would be quite funny to, ha to have 13, 13 barrels all in the middle of this thing. Just, just going yeah, with the guys shouting, come on, get on with it. Come on, move ahead, get on, go faster. Is it a floater? It's quite heavy.
we're going to go to some reasonably remote places, sometimes places that you know, very, very few people have seen. There's plenty of New Zealand that we haven't seen yet. I think people think it's such a small country, and Lord of the Rings, we saw so much of it that we must have seen everything, but believe me, we haven't. There's a, there's a huge amount of wonderful locations still to come. It's quite a pretty spot, isn't it? It's great. It's a great spot. Well, we'll say goodbye for now, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this update, and there may well be another one coming during the break sometime, so keep your eye out for that. I thought it would be good to carry on talking to Andy Circus about some of the fun and games we had uh, during our first block of shooting. Andy. Andy? Where is he? Andy! What is this place? This isn't Wellington. Where am I? Isn't this where James Bond crashed his Aston Martin in 1964? And isn't this where Red Grant trained to be an assassin at the beginning of From Russia With A Love? You know what? I, I think we should just run the blog anyway. So what we did is we asked cast and crew to tell us a few of their favourite memories from the first three or four months of shooting. So please enjoy that and I'll go figure out where I am. What are the things that stand out for you the most from the first block? I think for me, the mo my favourite stuff we've done so far has been Gollum's Cave. Was that precious? The way that Pete did that scene, it felt like I was watching a play. It was sort of like you could just sit back and watch these, these amazing guys do their thing. Him and Martin together were fantastic. It was really cool. Trying to get back into the head of Gollum. I don't know if I ever told you, but it felt like um, kind of doing an impersonation of a character that I played. <laughs> um, Yes. A, a long time. It was weird because it was like, you know, having to reown it again. No! Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was a nice I, way to start. I felt sorry for Martin because he was suddenly thrust into having to find the character of Bilbo and have to deal with you for yeah. the whole week. <laughs> <laughs> Going at him the whole yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was supposed to be a bit intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a good movie. <laughs> Check it out. After two years of, oh my God, when are we ever going to shoot this film? We had 13 dwarves and a hobbit. We might have had a, a wizard as well. And suddenly, it's real. Seeing the sets were like amazing. That was true. I mean, yeah. coming to Bag End for the first time and, and, and walking through. This is, that was our first day, wasn't it? Well, it was, first yeah. day on the job. That was amazing. Can you name them? Name the dwarves. Ori Dori Nori, Biffa Boba, Biffa... That's a bomber both for Ori Nori Dori Nori. I can never remember. See, that's the problem. You can't even remember who they are. You have Philly and Kelly. There's uh, Thorin, and there's Noin, uh, and there's Oin, and uh, Dwalin and Balin, and there's Biffa, Bofa and Bomber, and then there are the three uh, Dori, Nori and Ori. I think that's it, isn't it? She's like a camera. I think so. <laughs> Thirteen Dwarves is one of the reasons why I dreaded The Hobbit and why I really didn't think I was going to make it for such a long time. But uh, the irony is it's turned out to be one of the joys of the film. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> what a challenge. I mean, 13 uh, heroes, or 14 with, with, with Bilbo. They all have to be differentiated in a way that isn't necessary in the book, but if you keep seeing them, you want to know who they are and, and, and uh, specifically and, and what their attitude is and why they're on this journey. We need to move now! Come on! Some of the best memories were um, getting the dwarves ready. Everybody has helped these actors kind of find their way through lots of rubber and lots of hair. <laughs> 
walking through Weta and, and getting to see our designs and going, actually, God, I look amazing. I look the most amazing of anyone. That was probably the best day, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you all said, gee, gee's amazing. That's an amazing gee, we did, yeah. Some of them actually look pretty bad before they get into the prosthetic. Some of them, for, in fact, for some of them, a prosthetic is making them look better, to tell you the truth, uh, which says something. Uh, Mark Hadlow, for example, springs to mind. I have this lovely bit down here, and then this moustache that comes up here. I look stunning. I actually look, I should be in the centrefold. One of the things that quite early on we discovered was that um, Mark Hadlow uh, likes to dress up in costumes, um, mainly sort of military type. And the really weird thing about his sailor outfits is that um, below the waist, nothing. But again, you know, he's a nice bloke, though. A little bit to cut. A little bit to cut. A little bit to cut. One of them doesn't have to wear a beard. Yeah, well, we are all very, very jealous of that. Actually, he is the Aidan Turner. He's the sexy dwarf. I don't even think he's got a beard, actually. Mainly because he's not old enough to grow one. He needs the hot one, I suppose, if you like that kind of thing. But if you like knitted cardigans and <laughs> knitted mittens, then I'm your fellow. <laughs> if there was a boy band in uh, in Middle Earth, he would be he would be he would be the Robbie leader Williams. of the Robbie Williams yeah. of, uh, of, yeah. of the Dwarf world. world. Whereas you'd be a <coughs> I think. Yeah, the roadie. Bomb would yeah. be a roadie. I think when people see the beards, beards are going to come back in big time. They are huge. Give us a kiss. Yep. Galak Dashwood Bar. We've all learnt uh, a bit of the dwarf language, Kosdor, so we all have a, uh, a kind of selection of words to fall back on, um, curses and battle cries. And when we speak dwarfish to each other most of the time, when we're all the time. Okay, here goes. <coughs> and Peter can guess what it is, and then I'll tell people. Caused Belcor. Caused Belcor. Caused Belcor. Peter? Uh, it means <laughs> mighty dwarf. And we had um, Trollshaw. Well, you got to do all the fun stuff in Trollshaw. Yeah, I we did. To, I had to shoot dialogue and things, and um, he got to do all the good fighting troll stuff. It is the great thing about the dwarves is that is that even though there's this comic element to some of the characters, not all of them, but, but some of them, they when they when they fight, they really fight. We started with three months of intense training. We did stunt fighting, we did horse riding, we did the gym four times a week, we did dwarf movement yes. intensely. They were trying to get us to a point where they could actually kill us and bring us back from the dead, kill us, bring us back from the dead, all the CPR and stuff like that, because that's what it'll be like on set. They did it by breaking us down. Yeah. They did it by essentially reducing us to the absolute amoeba stage, yeah. and then building us up again as dwarfs. We've come through it as better dwarfs, I feel. I do too. We, I mean, I know that William's discovered his inner dwarf. I have, and no, we all a, have actually. It's a frightening thing, but um, it's this is the job that had to be done. If I could say key moments uh, in block one, arriving in Rivendell and meeting Elrond and dining at his table, it really feels like you're stepping into Middle Earth. There are some who would not deem it wise. What do you mean? You're not the only guardian to stand watch over Middle Earth. I, I remember it now, but later on. I love working with Hugo and Kate back in Rivendell again. That was fantastic. I still can't quite get over being on set with the e Ian as Gandalf and then, you know, Kate Blanchett with Gladriel and Hugo with Elrond and you just feel like you step back into a movie again. Mm -hmm. so. Kind of weird. Is this a new one? This is different. Yeah, different one. High points really, I think, was getting Kate Blanchett with a long train. Beautiful Kate, that's beautiful. Yeah, that is. They're all going to want one. Just don't ask me to walk anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I like is that we're getting a little bit of the music into the movie too. The songs. Tolkien wrote quite a few songs for The Hobbit. I got to sing a song. You want to hum a few bars for us now? Oh, it's a classic song. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's after sort of Cole Porter, Gershwin, and that type of thing. There's an inn, there's an inn, there's a merry old inn beneath an old grey hill. He squeaked and saw it, and quicker the tune, while the landlord shook the man in the moon. It's after three, he said. <laughs> I think it'd be great if, if, if Dwalin just yelled the whole thing. 
Show the cat oh, the middle of the way, We'll swallow the tipsy cat! <laughs> Who is this? Metallic Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? Whether I'll be singing at the Oscars is a different matter, but um, hopefully some people might sing it in the shower. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> I think this is a Peter Jackson question. Which dwarf would you like to invite to dinner? Uh, and well, you know, I wouldn't invite any of them except myself. Mm, I'm afraid that the, the table manners aren't of the best. But you get your fist when you do that! They would not want that. Biffa over for dinner. <laughs> he would be no, like the bottom dinner. of the line. Ori, because he'd be very polite. Excuse me. Well, it'd be me, obviously. Um, because yeah, I'd cook. Stephen Hunter does pretty well with the bad table manners. He just eats so much. Have you seen the size of him? I mean, oh, good lord. He's enormous. I've tried to talk him about cutting down his cholesterol and his butter intake. I don't think he'd invite Nori because he'd steal all the silverware. He'd never invite Graham McTavish because no. he would sit there and glare at you and show his forearms. All night. Dwan's a real warrior. When he parties, he goes completely mad, like so many Scottish people. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the words kettle black calling pot come to mind. <laughs> I don't think you'd invite any dwarf to dinner, actually. I wouldn't have them all together, though. Not 13, maybe a couple at a time. <laughs> special, special person yeah. to meet here, John, John Rhys Davies. Yeah. It was fun on one of the days that we were in Bag Inn with the dwarves that John Rhys Davies came to visit. Oh, yeah? And yeah. Um, it was great to introduce him, not only to, to Gloin, who's his father in the story, but also to all the, all the other dwarves. <laughs> It's just like coming home to family. <laughs> I predicted what John would say, and he pretty much said it word for word. I could just imagine, you know, him saying, "Oh, you poor bastards!" <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, that's pretty much what he went on to say. You poor buggers! <laughs> when he gets you running up the hill in full armour, you'll enjoy that. <laughs> but you are going to be spectacular and you'll be chased by women all around the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, only, but only if you're in costume and makeup. <laughs> OK. All right. We've been here since January the 13th. So what is that, five months? And we haven't even scratched the surface. Who are you, Dublin Pete? Hey, I'm Dublin Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest moments was when we all put our gear on and we all stood together, sort of looking around at each other into the characters' faces. To stand in a circle and look at the guys that were going on the quest, I got a real tingle up my spine. Lovely, thank you, that's terrific. I think we can check the gate on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bittersweet moment, but it's time to leave. Hasta la vista. Then driving off. I am waiting for somebody, sorry. It could have been even... I know. Just go. Oh, really? Yeah, just go. We've had enough. Go. Are you oh. ripped? No, I, I'm not ripped. They're keeping the good people. Okay. Oh, hey, go oh, again. hey. We'll go now. Hey. Okay, we'll, we'll go, go now. Again. It's a bittersweet moment, but it's time to leave. Hasta la vista. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed that. I don't know whether there'll be any more because I have to find New Zealand, which I've lost. I think it's over here. Who is that odd little fellow? Action. Cut, lovely. Hi, welcome to our new blog. This time, we thought we'd talk a little bit about 3D. Get a good look at your uh, opening uh, shot. Uh, yeah, okay, there you go. Just arm in a little closer. Just watch your back. Hi, I'm Angus. Welcome to the world of 3D. Shooting The Hobbit in 3D is a dream come true. I mean, if I had the ability to shoot Lord of the Rings in 3D, I certainly would have done it. What I actually did on The Lord of the Rings is I had a 3D camera taking 3D photographs Hopefully, one day, maybe even on 3D Blu-ray, we might be able to actually show you some of the 3D photos from 
10 or 12 years ago. 3D and I've got reading glasses. It's all, all good. But now the reality is that it's not that difficult to shoot in 3D. I love it when a film draws you in and you become part of the experience. And 3D helps immerse you in the film. But the essence of our camera system is a camera called the Red Epic. Really, it's this thing that enables us to shoot 3D on The Hobbit. But of course, to shoot 3D, you actually need two cameras. The problem that we have in, in the cinema world is that the lenses that we use are so large that we cannot get an interocular similar to a human's, which is the separation between your eyes. For us to get the two cameras as close together as possible, they have to shoot into a mirror. We have to use a mirror system, which is a rig that's designed by a company called Threality. One's left eye, one's the right eye. One shoots through a mirror, the other one bounces off a mirror, and so the two images are perfectly overlaid. With using two eyes, we can move the cameras apart, and also, more importantly, is find a convergence point. For example, see around someone's face, just like you're looking at a friend. The convergence point is the screen plane itself. 3D forms two places, the positive space, which is inside the box, what you see behind the person who's standing on the screen, and negative space, which is what you feel comes out into the audience, an arm, a bullet, or whatever you want. And the whole idea with these rigs is you can change the interocular and the convergence as we're shooting. We can see that separation on a 2D screen with a left and a right eye overlay. So we can do this live throughout a shot, changing our 3D effect the whole way through. Roll sound. We're watching the movie in 3D as we make it. Oh, that looks so good. You almost feel like you're in it. <laughs> a lot of people have an image of 3D being big and cumbersome, and that's true but we've got a lot of different rigs that we've built for different purposes. It's actually easier in this weird 3D world to have different camera systems for different uses. So this is a camera that we built to go on a crane that can move around and it never comes off the crane. This is the, the TS5 in a handheld mode. It's our main workhorse camera. It's light, it's small, so it allows Peter to get into very tight, narrow corridors and caves as if he would with a, a 2D camera. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, mobile camera work has always been very important for the films that I've made, and the last thing I wanted to do when we went to 3D was to restrict or change the shooting style. So with the camera doing the help as well, yeah. you, you don't need me to do much. It was very important for The Hobbit that we feel like the same filmmakers have gone back into Middle Earth to tell a new story. We're shooting at the same speed as you'd shoot 2D. Dolly's cranes, steady cam, we put it on the shoulder and we shoot handheld. The same as we would always shoot a movie. Of course, once you've got three or four cameras for main unit, you need three or four cameras for second unit, which is eight cameras, which is really 16 cameras. This is the world of the Hobbit camera department. We have 48 Red Epic cameras, and they're on 17 3D rigs. This one's called Walter, which was my grandfather. This one's Ronald, my uncle. Emily was Fran's grandmother. Perkins was actually Fran's dog. Witchy Poo, Frank, Bill is my dad. Fergus is the name of one of our pugs. Tricky Woo, that's the name of uh, Pekingese. Stan is another one of our pugs. There's cameras called John and Paul, George and Ringo, who are not relations of mine. Are we having fun? Yay! We're not shooting film. We shoot digitally. We shoot onto these cards, which slot in the side of the camera. And each one of these is 128 gig. On top of that, you're shooting at 5K resolution. A very sharp, clear image. It needs like a chart, but, uh, you know, like 5K's there, 4K's about there, and then your 1080, home TV is down here, so it gives you sort of an idea of the amount of information that we're actually capturing on these. Let's do another one of those. 48 frames, yes. Yep. We're shooting The Hobbit at a higher frame rate, at 48 frames per second, which is twice the normal 24 frames. The human eye sees 60 frames a second, so 48 frames is more of a natural progression toward giving the, the viewer what they would actually see in the real world. The people who have seen scenes of The Hobbit at 48 frames a second often say that it's like the, the back of the cinema has had a hole cut out of it where the screen is and you're actually looking into the real world. Once you add stereo and it gives you that, that extra ability to control depth, you can devise ways in which um, it can become part of the storytelling of a film. For instance, in Mirkwood, we really play on the fact that 
It's a forest that's kind of hallucinogenic almost. It draws you in. It makes you part of it and you may never get out. What we want is just to stay where you are and then... Stay back! Stay where you are! Milkwood is a big forest and it's full of vines and sinister looking trees, I suppose you say. It has a lot of things hanging down, a lot of things coming from all sorts of angles. And it helps us with the 3D to be able to, to push into that and try and get the audience to feel that they're actually trying to move into the forest with the cameras and give it that dark and look over your shoulder feeling. Colour-wise with the red camera, it tends to eat colour a little and so we add more colour. If you look at the ungraded footage, the trees look incredibly psychedelic. They look like they were painted in 1967. We wouldn't normally be quite as bold as this, even in Mirkwood, which is an enchanted forest, so it's like we oversaturate. Look! In the movie, they won't look anything like that. They'll be graded down and you'll just get the barest hint of colour in the finished film. They're coming back! 3D 48 frames is pretty unforgiving and we have to change our whole way to go about colouring these things because what we found out in early tests is that if there wasn't enough red in, in these pieces, they would punch up yellow and react differently than normal skin with blood running through it. So here's an example. This is Graham McTavish as Dwalin. And um, we've had to uh, add a lot of red, red tones to his makeup. So if you notice, if you stick your hand up next to your face, how incredibly pale this man is right now. I've barely seen daylight for the last six months, that's fine. Yes. So we have to add the blood in the piece to make him look like a normal flesh tone. It looks freaky now, but on, on film it's going to read beautifully. Fingers crossed. With the 3D HD stuff, it is amazing how when people's hair moves around on the wigs, it has to actually be the real thing. It has to be real hair. And you find because the number of frames a second you're using and so on and so forth, if you've got real hair moving around, it just looks real. I've never worked on a film that's 48 frames per second and uses the cameras that we're using. It's challenging to look for fabrics that work. I know full well that a fabric that we bought ages ago for a dressing gown for Bilbo would probably make people feel sick if they saw it on camera. It's got spots on it with a little spot inside it and it would just be like someone throwing stones at your face, I think. So I've avoided that fabric like the plague. It's in very poor taste! Others are just a joy to behold and the camera picks it up and the audience could see every last detail so in that sense it's really exciting. This film is really breaking new grounds in many ways as far as the technology of the filming goes but John and I are still working in our time-honored methods of pencil and charcoal composing pictures in 2D and we thought we'd try and come up with some way of actually incorporating a 3D aspect into the way that we were producing the concept art. That might communicate more clearly to Peter and to the other technicians. So what we're doing is two drawings. One is in red, one is in blue, and the 3D glasses have a red lens and a blue lens, one for each eye. Don't, don't go too heavy on it. This is probably the first serious cinema production where the actual concept art has been done in 3D. Rather than sharing just the same office, we're actually sharing basically the same vision. Vision, yeah. There's been a bit of a tendency for me to take on the blue. And obviously, you know, sitting on the right-hand side of the picture, it's easier to actually get your head around the left side. It doesn't make sense when you try and explain it like that. It's a huge help for Peter because we're actually proposing the full depth. I mean, it means Peter has to wear glasses when he looks at our art, but... Yeah. You know, my God, coming at you, look at that. Whoa. If you happen to have a pair of glasses like these at home, you should be able to see the artwork in 3D. You look great. Very three dimensional. You've definitely improved. I, I know. So I hope you found this blog interesting. I know it's a little frustrating because just about everything we've been talking about you can't actually see at the moment. You can't see the 3D, you can't see the 48 frames, you can't see the 5K, but you will. Um, December 2012, you'll finally get a chance to see what we've been talking about. Anyway, I've got to get back to set. It looks like they're almost ready for me down there. We're actually shooting today, as you can see, in a pine forest, but it's not really a pine forest. It's a uh, polystyrene and plaster pine forest but very shortly we're going to be leaving the studio and moving on to locations for a few months so the next time we see you will be from a location somewhere in New Zealand catch up with you soon
and boats, eh? Everybody thinks they're a sailor. So welcome to our new blog, which is about the logistics of location shooting. We've been travelling pretty much the length and breadth of New Zealand shooting locations for The Hobbit. It's been great to get outside. It's been great to get that texture of Middle Earth into the movie. After many, many weeks of shooting in the studio, we've established our characters, we've established our story, and it was finally time to get on the road and establish the landscapes of Middle Earth. So we're currently moving about 500 crew for main unit to Hamilton and then about 200 second unit crew to various parts of the country. We like to call it the biggest logistical move in cinematic history. Just because of the size of the fleet, close to 140 vehicles. As you can see, we're moving around a huge circus. I think everyone is secretly scared but quietly excited. The main reason for going on location on the project is to capture the scenic beauty of New Zealand. Peter's often said one of the things that won the fans over so much in the Lord of the Rings series was the unbelievable vistas and scenics because they were so magnificent. People are really excited about getting outside and, and taking this on the road. These are our changes from main unit crew, so this is how big we actually are. We're probably over 500. Everybody has to be in the right vehicle at the right time, they have to travel to the right place, they have to have rooms to be able to sleep in. Uh, I can't begin to imagine the logistics involved with shifting the crew, the cast, the equipment that we have on the Hobbit. It's pretty mind-blowing. You have to take everything with you to produce the films. We're having to provide our own electricity, areas to cook food, areas for people to sit down and eat. You've got to provide water, the bathrooms and the toilets that people need. You have to have weather cover, heat when it's cold, and you've got to provide cooling when it's hot. The daunting aspect of that is it's all got to get into trucks, it's all got to be on wheels, and it's all got to be ready to roll. We're about to try and cram all of this, and all of that, all of this, some of that, most of this, all these trucks, most of these people, but not that scissor lift up there that stays, are going to go into some of these trucks. These guys here are going to go into these trucks too. Nice one. No cell phone laws here, man. One of our biggest challenges on the production is actually shooting all the locations in one hit for both main unit and second unit. And you can certainly start there. We're away for about seven and a half weeks if the weather holds up, so we're basically praying that every spot we go to in the country is sunny and beautiful. First location oh, is Magic up in Old Hobbiton, so returning back to the first spot from the Lord of the Rings, which is pretty exciting. Fantastic job, and we're out right here at four o'clock in the morning. And as you can see, we're totally under control. <laughs> Oh. Why are you helping? I've got to carry this. We're going to some of the remotest locations of New Zealand, and if there's one thing grips can't live without, that's the latte, soy. That's right. We're getting ready to go away, and so far we haven't packed anything. And tomorrow is our last day. We're 30 on Hobbits, doing a big scene of Green Screen on for Hobbiton. This is my Louis Hobbit, my Sunny Hobbit. <laughs> So we need a, the largest team on because we've also got to try and pack. And then they're going to say, where did you pack it because I'll need it? Where's that wig? Did you put it away? No, we've got to put it on his head now. And we'll all be here till midnight trying to load up the buses because they leave at 4 o'clock in the morning. Be sure to pack scotch, tequila, wine and beer, a heap of plants, three razor blades, 60 kilos of toilet paper, a few artificial trees, socks, and some Jägermeister. Last day in Wellington, so everything needs to move. We've got a stock truck coming in to take our 49 mixed age sheep, 15 chickens, 9 goats, 5 3 year old steers, 4 pheasants, 2 Muscovy ducks. We've also got Michael Jackson, the walking chicken, on the lead. We're just going to take you through, get your contracts done. We've got lunch packed for you to take on the road. So just follow me. Oh, your keys are in it. Keys are in it. We've got GPS units installed in the trucks purely so we can watch what's happening as they move up and down the country. If you don't arrive, we can't shoot. Last truck should be out of here in half an hour, and then Hobbiton. Crikey. Just remember, the reason you're on this plane is because you're so valuable to the production.
a main unit had over 100 units on wheels that were travelling to the first location. That was quite a feat in itself, just having that amount of drivers on the road. It's all about arrows, it's all about maps and directions. Once we arrive, we get in and it's about an eight-hour turnaround from when the first truck turns up to when the unit base is actually functional for filming. They've got to get these trucks level for working in, got to get them all powered up, and they've got to get them all functioning so quickly. Prosthetics, makeup, costume, catering. It's not just a case of a small crew going into very out-of-the-way places. We're literally occupying the space of a football field. I think it's actually two football fields. We moved 7,000 cubic metres of dirt to accommodate everything that goes with making a film of this size with this many people involved. It's very much a mini city. To everyone's amazement, you know, they went home on Friday night in Wellington, turned up to work here on Monday morning and everything's here, parked up in order and looking good and working. It's okay. <laughs> Rough day at the office today, Mark. So after 110 days in the studio, we finally make it out into the sunshine. But I'll tell you what, Hobbiton is looking fantastic. The art department and the greens department have been working on it for nearly two years. The grasses have grown, the flowers are out, and the plastic ones have even bloomed. It's weird when you come back to a place that you literally thought you would never see again. This is a great spot. To be standing there with Elijah dressed up as Frodo, <laughs> it was the nearest thing I think I'm ever going to come to a time machine. This is actually the first time I'm stepping foot down into Hobbiton. I'll never forget that feeling of coming to Hobbiton for the first time. So much time spent in this universe, you know, with these characters, and and I keep referencing the fact that I turned 19 when I came to Hobbiton for the first time. <laughs> 11 years ago. I'm 30 now. <laughs> I don't know, there's so many feelings of nostalgia and history. We'd been searching pretty much the whole country for this rolling green countryside. We were up here scouting around and found this place called Buckland Road. And uh, sure enough, when we flew over it, we found the round tree, the hill, the lake. It was all meant to be. Of course, then it was a matter of talking to the owners of the land, getting their permission to shoot here and build here. It was a Saturday afternoon during a major New Zealand rugby game and he came and knocked on my father's door and he said they wanted to make a movie and my father actually said, Lord of the what? And I think I kicked him under the table quietly, but uh, that's how it all started. This time around they built it for real. So before, all of these hobbit holes were built using polystyrene. When the filming was finished, they tore it all down. And even though it's been available for tours and, you know, for people to look at it, we didn't have any of the Hobbit holes here. Doing the Hobbit now, it gave us the ability to rebuild Hobbits out of permanent materials. Materials that aren't going to deteriorate, and we can carry on showing people what's involved in making a movie behind the scenes. It's all, I mean, that's actual rock, stone. It's pretty amazing. Hobbiton is going to stay exactly as it is today, which is fantastic. So there's real wood, there's real stone, real bricks, and it's going to be here hopefully for decades to come. Yeah. No, it's, a, so it's, um, it's a great gift to the people of uh, so Manama and uh, as Minister yeah. of Tourism. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Some prime real estate. Hobbits. Hello. 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 You guys having a good day? Yeah, it's good. How are those feet treating you? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Are they? When you're at Hobbiton, you forget that you're on a film set. Seeing it like this kind of living model village is just extraordinary. And you just totally believe this place exists. And that's because it does. Maybe I've smoked a little bit too much of this um, now. It's an authentic village. It's 100% 360 degree, look wherever you like, little Hobbit village. You can imagine just being a hobbit in this environment and get up and have a cup of tea on the doorstep and listen to the birds and the frogs and the children running around. Or go to the market, buy a big bottle of beer and drink it. That's <laughs> loving it! You're not really designing a film set, you're trying to put yourself in the mindset of a hobbit and figuring out, well, where would you like your house to be? There are 44 personalised hobbit holes and each hobbit hole has the different little details depending on their location. It's kind of amazing, the door's actually open. 
Hello? Hello? No. Nobody home at the moment. They must be at the market. Welcome to the set of The Hobbit. So how did you get involved in this? My four daughters auditioned and they all missed out. <laughs> and I got in. So I wasn't a popular father at that point. <laughs> You guys are up for stealing, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Good. Yeah, big bag hobbits. Check this out. Oh, yeah. I'd like to get a nice comb over. Is this going to be in the movie? Yeah, we can cut that. That's fantastic. We've got that. <laughs> so we just finished our first week on location. Get out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I just wish I could move into one of these hobbit holes. I mean, this would be an absolutely idyllic place to live. It really would. This is the sort of place that I would very happily retire to. In fact, uh, might think about it tonight or the next day. We could retiring here. That would be quite nice. I hope you enjoyed the first part of our location blog. The second part will be ready very early in the new year. And in the meantime, we've just shot the last shot for The Hobbit in 2011. So it only remains to do one last thing, which is to wish you all a Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> Very good.